All right, people, we need to talk. Amazon is producing a new Lord of the Rings series, the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Because Jeff Bezos said, hey, we need everyone to know that this is just like the trilogy. Except worse, because apparently the rings, the rings was the best that they could come up with, but like death, whether you like it or not, it's coming for you. And today, we're gonna go through all of the reasons that you're allowed to hate the show, and all of the dumb reasons to hate the show. So, this is level one seriousness, so we're starting with my gilded sting. But, tell me down below, what are you most frustrated or afraid about with the show? I know something came to mind, and what might you potentially look forward to the most? I really want to see Numenor, shoot me. This video is sponsored by Campfire. Because maybe you can write a better story than Amazon. Oh, and if you didn't know, On Writing and World Building Volume 2 is out. It's got all of the writing and world building discussions we've had, and the series as a whole has sold nearly 50,000 copies. Go get a copy of it for yourself today. Links down below. Number one, you hate Amazon. Amazon is a terrible company that mistreats its employees and Jeff Bezos is a money hoarding smog whose only way of showing love to his children is buying them another McDonald's franchise. <laughs> and maybe you don't want to support Amazon's new ventures. And you know what? All power to you. I can get behind that. Or I won't because I'm gonna watch the show anyway, but the principle's there. Number two, you don't want or trust anyone with making any more Tolkien things. Maybe you don't trust the creatives behind the series whose greatest works before this included, uh, uncredited writing role in Star Trek Beyond, picked because of their vision aligning with Amazons? Yeah, that's not enough for a lot of people. You just think the man died in 1973 and you've had one great adaptation, why do we need any more? Especially because they don't even have the rights to most of what they're trying to adapt. I mean, they don't even have the rights to the Silmarillion and I can get why it feels like someone puppeting a corpse. It's uncomfortable to watch and it's only a mimicry of the real living thing. So I get that. And sometimes I see people mocking others who feel this way because they go, you know, ah yeah, because an adaptation of a thing I like prevents me from enjoying the original. But I think this is dumb because nobody thinks it's going to ruin their enjoyment of the original thing. Instead, it's that it feels like someone is making a mockery of something you love. And I can get that. I hate Shyamalan's The Last Airbender film, not just because it's poorly made, but because it's a terrible representation of a story very close to my heart. When I say, have you seen The Last Airbender? And they go, oh, you mean the movie? because it badly affects how people perceive something that I love, that I want to share with others. Of course, you do also have to recognize that even if the show is terrible, and we don't know it will be, it's gonna drive people to buy the books and read them for themselves. That always happens. Even if an adaptation is terrible, it brings people into the community. I started reading A Game of Thrones when the show came out, and even though the show didn't have a fantastic end, while well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. It continued to fuel people buying and reading the books for themselves, and that's great. So in a roundabout way, even if the show is terrible and we don't know it will be, it's still gonna bring more people into the world of Tolkien and get them to engage with it on a more personal level. Which is good, right? Even so, I still understand the fear and frustration with something you love being represented badly. That's a totally valid emotion. Number three, and we're gonna switch up blades here because we're going, we're going up a level of seriousness. So we're switching over to Legolas's short blades and I actually have no idea what the name of these blades are. So if you do know, uh, let me know in the comments. But anyways, number three, and this is my main fear for the show. And that is that they're going to prioritize their stories over Tolkien's. Now, the Second Age takes place across 4,000 years. It covers the growth and expansion of various elven kingdoms and the Numenorians, Sauron's rise to power and his manipulation of the men, elves and dwarves, the fall of Numenor and the last alliance with Isildur taking the One Ring for himself. Those are the big bullet points. But here's the thing, like I said, most of all of that is described in this book, which Amazon doesn't have the rights to. So instead, they're coming up with kind of a shorthand version that is covered in references in the Lord of the Rings and the appendices, which is just not quite the same. So they're already hamstrung in the way that they can tell Tolkien's story. And 
it only gets harder because, to be honest, Tolkien wrote in ways that are very difficult to adapt. Like, take this passage describing Arpharazon, the last king of Numenor, taking Sauron captive. Then Arpharazon, in the folly of his pride, carried Sauron back as a prisoner to Numenor. It was not long before he had bewitched the king and was master of his council, and soon he had tamed the hearts of all Numenorians, except the remnant of the faithful back towards the darkness. I mean, what do you do with that? And that's from the appendices, the stuff they do have the rights to, and they will be trying to adapt. There are these huge gaps in the lore of Tolkien's world. That means adapting these stories requires you to invent new characters and expand these storylines if you ever want it to work in any kind of modern serialized format. And a lot of people are feeling very anxious about that quote that came from the creators saying, can we come up with the novel Tolkien never wrote wrote and do it as a mega event series that could only happen now, which sounds like they're trying to create the next Marvel Cinematic Universe, but I'm interpreting that as them just going, hey, Tolkien really didn't expand on a lot of these stories and scenes and characters, and so we're going to have to do that. Which is fine, I recognize that. So, all power to them adding new things to elevate the stories that Tolkien wrote. But. I'm also kind of worried that because there are so many gaps in the lore that they can fill, or they want to fill, that they might instead use those gaps to tell their own stories that don't really come from Tolkien's spirit or vision. That there is so much room in Tolkien's writing that they're going to prioritize the stories that they create rather than Tolkien's. It does seem that Elrond and Galadriel are going to be the driving characters of the story, but we also do have non-canon characters like Hellbrand, a love story between an elf and a human, and another elf called Arundir, and a few others I'm sure. And as said, simply adding characters is not inherently a bad thing. Like, Sometimes Tolkien will describe events in the abstract or movements within a civilization, but he won't attach characters to them. So this is one way to give those events a face, a way to explore them in this medium. And I think I'm fine with that. We will not know which stories they're prioritizing until the show airs. And come on, we've had one trailer and it was a minute long and some people are already making up their minds? Come on. And may I remind you that even with changes, this would not be the first time that changes to a book have still yielded a beautiful, memorable story. Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick became Blade Runner, one of the most important, influential, well-crafted science fiction films of all time, and has one of the most iconic scenes of all time. Like tears in rain. So here is a drop of hope and a bucket of skepticism. Number four, Dwarf Woman No Beard. Everyone knows that Tolkien only cared about three things when making Middle Earth. Number one, the power of friendship. Number two, New Zealand's tourism industry. If there's a mishap during takeoff or landing, brace yourself on the sea in front of you. And number three, Dwarf Woman Beards. What have you done, Jeffrey? What did you do with our big beefy Dwarf Woman Beards? Did you get rid of them after they tried to unionize? <laughs> Number five, it's to The Hobbit. Let me explain what that means. So we all know that the worst parts of The Hobbit were the bombastic, pointless action scenes like the barrel riding or the fight with Smaug and the golden statue. It's this question of why would a character do X when they can do it with an explosion behind them or in slow-mo or with a fancy stunt. There's this shot of Arundir catching an arrow and someone leaping up in the air in slow-mo. And in my opinion, if there's too much of that, I don't think I'll vibe with it. Tolkien's works do have these huge mythic moments, but they're usually pretty subtle or down to earth. Like you even look at Gandalf's confrontation with the Balrog, and it's got a subtlety to it that a lot of big monster confrontations don't. But again, Melon, we have only seen the trailer. So this isn't something to judge of the show anytime yet. It's just about my expectations going into it and something I think a lot of other people will share. Number five, Dwarf and Elf Not Black. This is the big one, right? This is the one that everyone's talking about. All right, fine. Let's sit down, let's talk about it. 
Or you can sit down, I can't sit down while I'm filming. So instead, here is a picture of a chair. It is 100% understandable to be frustrated about things you love and not being adapted faithfully. I just talked about my own frustrations with that. And this is especially the case in the Tolkien community who have always had an uncommon loyalty to the exact vision of the author. And dismissing those feelings and concerns as just racism makes you a prick, okay? But also, if you're looking at the Rings of Power and you're hyper fixating on a black dwarf and a black elf, then maybe faithfulness to Tolkien isn't your only concern. And it's worth thinking about where that hyperfixation and anger at specifically this change comes from. Because having a black elf and a black dwarf meaningfully changes what exactly? Law wise, yeah, I'm not gonna pretend that there were darker skinned elves. It's unlikely that that was ever the case in Tolkien's vision. And there were only ever maybe darker skinned dwarves. And I can understand people not liking change from Tolkien's vision on principle, but there are so many changes that are far more fundamental to Tolkien's vision and mythology than this. For example, compressing the timeline of thousands of years to just 150 or so removes the poetic discussion of the fall of civilizations rather than individuals, and it minimizes the unique role that elvish immortality plays in Middle Earth. But for a lot of reasons, a black elf and a black dwarf are getting a lot more attention. Hellbrand is another non-canon character, but I've heard a hell of a lot more about Arendir than I ever have heard about him. And this is despite the fact that everything we've seen so far indicates that Hellbrand is going to play a much larger role in the story and probably amount to a much larger change. Some people are saying that this is to do with world building, because ethnicity is a thing in Middle Earth, as it is in many stories, in the same way that languages are. But even that only suggests a much lower racial diversity, and guess what? Everything we've seen indicates that's the case anyway. A lot of people are concerned about how Tolkien was drawing on English and Celtic and Finnish cultures when creating the elves, and he was, but I don't think that these characters stop the story from exploring and representing those cultures in a meaningful way. It doesn't stop it from being a mythology for England like Tolkien wanted, and I think we've got to be careful about thinking too allegorically about the racial groups in our world and the racial groups in Middle Earth. But it's complicated, right? Because Middle Earth was created as a mythology for England, and Tolkien drew explicitly on ancient Celtic, Finnish, and Anglo-Saxon cultures and traditions in creating much of his world. And I do think that it is really important to depict those if they're gonna do this right. They shouldn't pretend like those aren't important influences. And I think we should be really careful about forcing allegory between racial groups in our world versus Middle Earth. Not only because Tolkien famously hated allegory, but especially when these lines between these peoples are not nearly as defined as some people like to imagine. Like, Tolkien explicitly noted that Gondorians were culturally Egyptian in some ways, while their religion was Hebraic, while also being European. But if you're reducing that cultural influence down to skin color alone, and only looking it through the lens of these couple of characters, and hyper fixating on this in the way that some people are, I think that's reductive, and the wrong way to approach this. The amount of anger at this change specifically is just disproportionate. There definitely were influences, and we see those in the show so far, but it's definitely not as concrete as some people think, and it's gotten really ugly when some people have taken the sense of ownership just too far. People seem to be hyper fixating on these two characters as some symptom of a wider political agenda. And to that, all I have to say is, if this is your bar for politicizing something, then the problem isn't with the adaptation, but with your obsession with looking at this politically. Oh, also, I've seen a ton of people posting this quote, usually in reference to this. Evil cannot create anything new, they can only corrupt and ruin what good forces have invented or made. And that's a beautiful quote, isn't it, you know? But I want you to know, if you're so concerned about faithfulness to Tolkien's vision, then at least get the quote right, because he never said it. He did say other similar things, but not that, so if you want to post it, at least post one that's right. So, is there any hope? If they work to explore that ancient Celtic, Anglo-Saxon, and other Northern European identities, then I think it's still going to be a really faithful and honest adaptation, just like Tolkien would have loved to see, and I would too. We're gonna be able to see parts of Middle Earth that we've never crossed before, and I think that's awesome. I'm pumped to see Sauron as something other than a pure evil dark lord in a tower or someone that comes out on a battlefield, but as a political manipulator behind the scenes, you know? Someone with character and plans and 
Ah, oh, it's gonna be good. I'm pretty skeptical of changes too, but I think a lot of people are reading too much out of what is really a very small change. And that's manifested in, to be perfectly honest, some pretty ugly and uncomfortable rhetoric online. I don't know how it'll turn out. Maybe it'll be a classic. Maybe there never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. But still, enough to give it a chance. So, instead, let me leave you with a quote from Tolkien himself. A real quote about hope. For of us is required a blind trust and a hope without assurance, knowing not what lies before us in a little while. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future. Campfire. What is a campfire? A campfire is an open air fire around a camp, often used for cooking. It's a place that you, yes you, can make stories and characters and worlds. Do you want to make a story where your feet are actually squirrels? You can do that. Or maybe you want to make a character who says really dumb things like, I really loved the romance from the Hobbit trilogy. You can do that with campfire. And it's got pages for everything. But don't listen to me, listen to God. Hey, hey kids! kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, click, click the, the link, link down in the, the description. description. I'm, I'm trying, trying campfire, campfire right, right now. now. I'm, I'm making, making a world that's, that's even better, better than your, than your one. one. <laughs> wow, what a guy. Click the link below. Buy my book. Join my Patreon. Buy my book. Join my Patreon. I have to do this. To pay my mortgage. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> if I want to eat. It's here. It's spare. It's beautiful. I don't know what rhymes with that. <laughs>